Can you get him to? Can you get Cam to say Dyron? Can, can you, Cameron? Can you say Dyron Aspria? Dyron Aspria. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Cameron might be fluent in Spanish before yeah. he's fluent in English. <laughs> that's your that's your cold open right there. Oh, from Brooklyn, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental. I'm Andrew Weed with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Kaylin Carr, Matt Doyle. What's up, boys? Big show today for you. Merritt Paulson, the owner of the Portland Timbers, is going to come by. I mean, he would probably put up the Mount Rushmore if that was a real thing, but he's going to share his. <laughs> did he offer us. funding? He did not. We did not ask him about funding. We probably should have done that. You know, I've I've also you know I've tried to get him to build a Diego Valeri statue in the past, and that wasn't right. met with as much enthusiasm. Yeah, well, don't waste thought. time trying to double dip because Valeri is clearly going to be on Mount Rushmore. Where, where just would you build put it? One Maybe thing. Multnomah Falls. You could just etch it right into the stone. Okay, right what about like Mount Hood? Can't you see Mount Hood? Oh from, yeah, from Portland. So just yeah. like carve up a, a face of that or like a side of that got four faces got room for more than that to be honest with you just put it on top of the gym that sits on the back of the <laughs> province park or whatever it's called <laughs> wow we got deep into that geography like that. is a strength clearly of taylor i'd never That's we should of. be where yeah we, each city where we are you out where do you build it all right, we're going to tackle yeah. the Ooh. Portland Timbers today, obviously. FC <laughs> Cincinnati are today Taylor as well. Taylor just launched so. five more episodes. <laughs> That's what we need. Those are the ideas we need, man. Just drag us through this pandemic. Please, please, please. Speaking of that, I hope you, you guys, guys are safe and sane out there. Yeah, also, we're closing up on the Mount Rushmore. So what do you guys want to hear next? So for the fans, mailbag, at Extra Time on Twitter. Anders is deep in the Twitter feed at all times, 24-7. Mm -hmm. So... Send us whatever you want to hear us talk about. We have four more teams left after today. Next week, we have New England and Colorado on Monday. Shalri Joseph, just for you, Dave, and Marcelo Balboa Imagine. will be the guests there. And then on Thursday, we're going for Preki for Sporting Kansas City, mostly just for story time. I want to know how he won an MVP at 40. And then Miguel Ibarra for Minnesota. So I think those are pretty solid. And then after that, of course, we have the uh, GTOAT, the greatest team of all time. That's not very catchy. We'll figure out something better for that one. But also the Dead Club Mount Rushmore, which is Chivas USA Fusion and Mutiny. Uh, so Valderrama starts that one out, but figuring out the rest of it should be interesting. Wait, wait you got Valderrama for the for the show? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Sorry. sorry to be I will try. We'll try. Dude, he's but... around, dude. He posts up in Florida. He's just I saw him in. once he's on at every a... Univision thing. I saw him at a Copa America game, Centenario, and I, I wanted to ask for a photo. I didn't do it, but... Uh, I was with Susanna. I remember just being like, just staring at him. He still had the beads going and of course the hair just, you know, it was... can I just say like, it's obvious that Carlos Valderrama was the first DP in league history. I know we didn't make the rule until David Beckham, but like P in 1996, he was in like, like he was a global icon at that. Oh God. I love Pibe. We got to, yeah. we got to do Yeah. We got to do the mutiny Mount Rushmore just so we could talk about Pibe. Are we doing just mutiny or are we doing dead clubs? Cause I feel we're doing like... dead clubs because okay. like Diego Can we Cerna's create a better get name. Love. Can we call them pass clubs? No, <laughs> dead clubs, <laughs> dead clubs. Come on. All right. She must you say spirit still lives in LAFC. <laughs> it's just going through the hallways there. I want to be here for the Chivas one. I want Chivas to fusion that. mutiny. I also maybe think we should do the MLS Mount Rushmore, like the overall one, because we, you know, the Beckham conversation. I, I just think it's a good, a good yeah. one. Then of course, we'll I think Dwayne album. Rollins was talking about this on Twitter that, yesterday because he was listening to our shows and he was like, "I think Dero might be on the MLS Mount Rushmore," and I was like, "I'm here for it." Yes. I, don't He's ever the, listen to word Doyle says. I don't. A care. different, a different Canadian is going to be on there. I have a real good take for the MLS Mount Rushmore, and I'll just. That, that's the tease. Right. We'll so. save it there. We'll also do the at-large uh, births and the seating for that great. I think I know where you're going. With that. Uh, yeah. So can I, I just want to start with this. Can Taylor I just bring I real quick before you, you get David. there? Oh, no, nice. I just, yeah. Can we just bring up the fact? Remember when Preki was going to coach Leicester City? Yes. Mm -hmm. Leicester City won the title like a year after that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is Preki almost won a Premier League title as a manager. Continue. We will ask Preki about that process, I'm sure, should we get him on here. We're still working on that one right now. Would you rather have that than an MLS Cup title, though? You got to think about it. Ooh. He's got one of those. Maybe <laughs> two. I'm saying. Yeah. He's got a, yeah, I think he's got a couple. Oh, more than that, yeah. Playing, coaching. He's yeah. Got, he's got some silverware. He's got some rings. Uh, by the way, dude, you Iowa, cut me bro. off there, and I know yeah. why. Keelan and I smoked you in trivia last night. Extra I don't know how you smoked night. me. Sorry, Wednesday, you mean Sasha Klesson and Jamie Watson smoked me in trivia hey, last look, night. Hey, look, use the tools <laughs> at your disposal. 
the tools at your disposal are other people playing trivia for you. Well, you know, no. whatever, you know, that's how you, trivia works. You guys were, I'm so angry about this. You guys were so bad at it that you literally didn't even know when you were making a wrong decision. For example, I knew Kalen would say Chris Armas for coaches, most games played. And I knew Weeby would say Robin Frazier, without a doubt. So my question, right. my hint was started for the LA Galaxy in the first ever MLS Cup. Neither of you even knew Chris Armas started in that game. So you took Armas off the list incorrectly <laughs> and you picked Greg Danny. I don't acknowledge any of Armas's time before the fire. It just I can't I can't imagine him anywhere else. I mean all that that you just angry. said is he just, literally scored the first goal in MLS Cup history. Well, Dang. all of that is look, all of that is is just extracurriculars because we hit the right answer, which is all that matters. Doesn't yeah. matter how we got there, just right. that we hit the right answer. I Every have respect right. for your Casio answer. I yeah, thought I, you get, I thought you get Julio Cesar earlier because you covered. Yeah, I should have gotten that one earlier. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I, I was we a figured it out eventually. The Tony Casio one. As soon as I heard intro league loan, I was like, "Oh, I got this. It's yeah. Tony Casio." That was. I thought you were reason. gonna go with the the draft one, my own draft. I was so ready for that. I thought you were gonna say. I was texting with Sasha afterwards about Leon Leandro de Oliveira, who is the Rebs pick. I think right before uh, Kai. So that's. I think that's what yeah. I was. Re I was ready for that one. And I then was trying to go somewhere. deep round, but the problem with yours is after you, it's really only Johnny B. Like there's no one else. Uh, Josie Altador. You ever heard of that guy? <laughs> was he? Uh, he went like 21. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 7 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. 7 p.m. Eastern every also, single Wednesday. Each year. That's got to be one of the best draft picks a little of all time. Kalen, Kalen had some years off. That made no sense. But Sasha pulled him back around on every single one. Very helpful. We're going to try to get Sasha on the show. I think we need to try to stump him as well. So as no, I said, he, wants on. he needs on MLS is uh, Instagram. We go live. We have a drink. We do some Twitter trivia as well during that time. So whatever platform you're on, do that thing. A real Kaylin, quick, can I uh, ask you no? a question right now? Sure. A trivia that I want you're, to put in. Yeah. Uh, do you know anyone who's played in a futsal world cup? Uh, yes. Jamar Beasley. B -b 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 True. Um, I want to say Andrew Jacobson. Yeah. He played okay. before he got drafted in 08. That's what's up. Yeah. So I was trying to create a futsal question and I was trying to do ones that were like so close that when you didn't get them, it smacked you in the face. But then yeah. I was worried that they'd be too easy. I I, th I think uh, I may know a few beach soccer World Cup guys, too. That's different. You're a Cali guy. I I'm, I'm coming up with some good <laughs> questions in my head right now. We'll save them for next <laughs> Wednesday. Back on track, folks. Thursday night, if you're listening to this on Thursday, MLS Idol, Soccer's Hidden Talent goes down. Our very own Susanna Collins. Trevi Davies hosting that one with Fox Sports' Rob Stone. Rolf Felcher, Ronald Matarita, Lee Wynn, and Keegan Rosenberry showing off their non-soccer talents. And uh, it's basically like American Idol for that. So you can vote on who should win. Hashtag MLS Idol and hit the last name of the player. And MLS Works is donating money. Uh, for each weekly winner to a local charity designated by the club. So it's pretty cool. It's on uh, um, Twitter and Facebook, MLS channels, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, every single Thursday night. Go check that out. Let's do Mount Rushmore. And before we get to Merritt Paulson and his takes, we have David, born in 74, Elliot. He says he's somewhat new to MLS at large, or at least paying any attention to any team other than the Sounders. Uh, he says these segments are really teaching him a lot of history, and he's loving it, so that's awesome. His Rushmore for the Sounders, he has Casey Keller in. He says he's surprised he didn't get mentioned more. Big in the community. Uh, and Siggy's name and his name helped bring a lot of talent into Seattle at the start. We loved him. He has Zach Scott. We're not talking USL, but big part of the Sounders community there, Ozzy and Stefan Fry. So big thanks to uh, David Elliott for enjoying these. And let's get to the Timbers. Before Merritt jumps on. Wait, 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 wait. He said no Ladero? He didn't have Ladero, which is shocking. Uh, oh, that's weird. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, I was just going to let him move on. Zach Scott would feel awkward walk, looking up at his own face. Like, like, oh, the Darrow's walking around with like <laughs> rings and MVP trophies. <laughs> like, okay. Anyway. Uh, so, Kaylin and I did this interview with Merritt on Wednesday. So, we know who he put on his Timbers Mount Rushmore. Now, I want to know from you, Goss and Doyle, who you think he put on the Timbers Mount Rushmore. Who in your mind would he put there? Who should be there? He probably put number one Timbers Army. Nope. Oh man, he stuck I to it. Was inside his head. He stuck to the. Uh, he stuck. <laughs> he stuck to, to the, the format. Yeah, and he, he stuck to MLS players. 
He did, yeah. We gave him an opportunity and to he, hit up the, you know, I'll give you a clue. I'll give world. you a clue. I asked him I asked him uh like how do you even approach this type of decision cuz I've been kind of torn myself and he said perform it was primarily performance based. So So the and 2 Diego. Longevity. So the yeah, 2 Diego yeah, yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think he said Jack Jewsbury, and I think he said either Darlington Nagby or Liam Ridgewell. Well, I know for a fact he said Liam Ridgewell because he tweeted back when we started the Mount Rushmore thing. He tweeted Liam Ridgewell is one hundred percent on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> so Boom. like that's that's not even <laughs> that's that, a tell. That's not even yeah. Like a, so that's a tell. So that's <laughs> that's three. Um, so I think Jewsbury was the last one that he picked. Think, I mean, Jewsbury makes a lot of sense. Um, I could see him saying Dyron Espria because Dyron has scored so many big postseason Ooh. goals. Um, <laughs> Lucas Milano, they don't win MLS Cup in 2015 without Lucas Milano. He had the the series clinching goal against FC Dallas in the Western Conference Championship. And then he had the game winning assist in MLS Cup itself. Did Abner Seves uh, just enter this? Podcast? <laughs> Doyle, do you remember my tweet? It was one of my I don't tweet much, but it was maybe the mm-hmm. best tweet I've ever had, which was predicting a Dyron goal. Remember that? Yeah, I mean, it's like that's a pretty low bar in the yeah. playoff. I mean, he that's is true. Mr. October, you know, or Mr. Yeah. November, I guess. Yeah. Um yeah. Do, did Chris I, Boyd enter the conversation at any point? Did not. No Chris Boyd <laughs> okay. in this Weird. one. Weird. Jorge Perlaza did get a mention though. Oh, so that, if you boy. remember that name, that's Whew. throwing it way back for you. That is all right. Let's hear. Let's hear it from Merritt himself. Here's that interview from Wednesday. All right. Let's welcome to extra time Merritt Paulson, the owner of the Portland Timbers. Merritt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And uh, particularly, particularly good to see you, Andrew. I, I you know, followed your experience, and uh, um, you know, props to you for for your recounting of, of everything that you and your family have gone through. And just good to see you. In, in, in person. So uh, uh, anyway, Caleb, I appreciate that. Always good to see you. One yeah. of many in New York City. Uh, just trying to let people know, do what you got to do. That's a good reminder. CDC, who all the different uh, organizations helping people during this COVID-19 pandemic. Help us flatten that curve. Keep it going down. Merritt, where's your head at right now? Soccer? Yeah, but maybe life more importantly. You know, um, it, it's where to start, right? I mean, I could give you an answer to that question that would take our entire uh, uh, time period. It's it's surreal, and, and if I hear people talk about unprecedented anymore, you know, it's it's but it is. I mean, and there's a reason why that that term uh, keeps getting brought up. My kids, you know, sort of asked me the other night, "Well, what was it like when you are were our age and we went through something like this?" And I'm like, "We haven't. <laughs> you know, this hasn't been something that." That, that uh, my mom or uh, your mom or, or or I have ever gone through in, in in our lifetime before. So there's no playbook. We're you know following the experts. I think that it'd be a lot easier if we had a clear light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm seeing some positive signs uh, right now that you know sort of are, are you know maybe giving some indication that we could start carefully uh, coming back. Uh, you know, as appropriate uh, to, to more life as normal, even though normal won't be for a while and until we really have a vaccine. But um, but anyway, it's, uh, it, it's it's been an experience. Really proud of our organization. I'd say that, uh, you know, that's something that I, I you know, our, our staff has stepped up in just a big, big way. Uh, and, you know, it's something that makes me unbelievably proud. Tell me a story, Mary, about your first game. I was thinking about that today because I talked to Timber Joey for the kick around, which we do at noon on MLS Twitter. And I, I was wondering, what would be Merritt's first game? We've talked a lot about what we miss. I mean, I'd love yeah. to hear the first time you, you took in a Timbers match. Did he tell you about the time I, I saw it a slice without giving him uh, uh, prior notice? He didn't. He <laughs> held that story back. But was, next our, time, our, we're going to have to pull it out. Our con- it was a CONCACAF home game against a Guyana team and we'd scored like six goals and I just at the end of the at the end I jumped up there and I figured I'd I'd saw I'd chainsaw a log slide slab off and had never done it before and I don't recommend somebody's first experience doing it in front of a crowd because there was not much log left after five goals and I he told me afterwards you realize you didn't have goggles on and you came within like an inch of the metal that would not have been as the sports center highlight I was 
for to have the saw just bounce right back into my face. Owner splits head yeah. saw trying to showboat, uh, you know, for supporters after a CCL game against, uh, you know, Guyana team. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Uh, you Passionate. Know, I, I think uh, the 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 first. I mean, the first game was in 2007, May of 2007. And, and you know, I've talked about it before. Prior ownership, uh, you know, had been baseball folks and um, Timbers had been sort of an afterthought. And from the get go, you know, we talked about uh, MLS and, and the opportunity there. I'd, I'd met with Don and Mark um, uh, with my family actually in 2005 uh, looking at San Jose. But, um, you know, when we talked with the, the ownership, um, you know, prior ownership, that there was a lot of the, you know, steer clear of these Timbers Army folks. You know, we banned these guys for flares, and we knew, we they had like a, a a rap sheet of of different people in the army. And um, our my first game, I just walked right through the army and sort of high five people, and um, uh, you know, it was it was amazing, and and it was uh, you know, I, I I saw right away why this was Soccer City USA. It didn't take a rock rocket scientist to see that, and I was a lot more into what we were doing when the soccer side, because we controlled the players, unlike AAA baseball. And, you know, first call we made, uh, uh, you know, after this deal was consummated was to Don saying, hey, remember us, you know, let's get MLS to Portland. That's awesome. Um, so as we look towards um, the Mount Rushmore, as we've debated this a lot for certain teams and, I've kind of gone back and forth even personally with the clubs that I've played for as far as you, how do you choose between your head or your heart a little bit? And, uh, you know, there's people that mean so much to the community in certain ways and the club, and then there's just sheer talent and performance on the field. You've got a unique perspective, of course, as an owner, but also someone who shares the passion of the fans. Uh, how would you make these decisions or how, what type of framework should we be looking at this through? First of all, this is not my favorite list. <laughs> you know, I want to make that clear at the, at, the, at the outset. I'm thinking just in terms, we've got a couple obvious decisions, uh, first and foremost, uh, for the Timbers. Um, but I think more just the impact uh, the, the individuals have had on the club. Uh, you know, I think you, you need to have a certain amount of tenure with the club. Uh, we've got almost 10 years of history. This would have been our 10th season in, in MLS. Hopefully will be our 10th season in MLS if we can get a uh, return to play uh, going in, in, in the right way. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so I think we've had some success um, and, and, you know, individuals who played obviously a big role in that success. I mean, it's, it's a difficult decision process to go through. I mean, we've obviously got a lot of uh, tenure in history as a club pre-existing MLS. And I mentioned Jimmy Conway, Clive Charles, John Bain. You know, there's a lot of people that you would argue should be, uh, at least those three would be on the short list of, of, of names that would probably be on a, uh, you know, one of those three at least from the NASL era on a Mount Rushmore, but we're not doing that today. Um, so I think it's more, uh, I, I, I think there's an off the field component to it, but I'm bring, probably, my opinion is more of, of a, you know, team locker room on the field kind of thing. All right. You see that from a unique perspective, as Kalen said. Let's get it going. I have three names that, to me, would be there, and then it gets quite murky. So I'm curious if your names, to start, would match up. So who would you put up first? Who goes up first as we get out the chisels for the Timbers? Um, Diego Chara. So, I, uh, you know, I'm going to – with the two Diegos, I'll go alphabetically, but, but uh, he, he'd be my – my number one and also he was a 2011 signing so he's been through with us the the whole ride and i mean i don't need to talk up uh uh chara to to, to you guys i mean i i again we talked about being able to spend an entire interview talking about um you know what's life like in this pandemic situation I, a much happier topic would be just talking up char i mean he's he's the greatest individual ever uh you know such a great guy off the field uh, such the consummate team player he lets other people you know take bigger risks i mean he's just capable of cleanup at a different level his passing is un is unbelievably accurate and underrated um you know he's the talisman and the heartbeat 
of 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 this club, and he has been, um, uh, you know, since since 2011. So um, he doesn't get all the accolades. He's only been on one All Star team. It's really been only in the last several years he's been getting the appropriate national recognition. Ozzy Alonso was kind of the six eight that that got talked up a lot more. I'd take Diego Char over him in a New York minute. So, and they're both great players. Tell me about scouting him. It's that's a long time ago now, but when you're building that first team to sign a player who would have the impact that he's had, the consistency, it would be, it's a dream come true, basically. So what did you see back in those days? Did you see this possibility? Was this in your mind at all, or was it just, oh, we'll see? Well, it's a, it's a good story because, first of all, I'm not the scout, and if I tried to be the scout, we'd have big, big issues. I, I pride myself on, you know, letting the soccer people do their job and getting myself to a position where I'm at least able to evaluate them. Um, but Gavin went to Columbia uh, to, to sign um, Jorge Perlaza, to scout and ultimately sign Jorge Perlaza, who is, if you guys remember, oh, yeah. uh, was a striker on our team, ended up having a really bad injury in Columbia that cut his career s- short, but was a pace guy, scored our first goal at home um, when we beat the Chicago Fire. Uh, but he called me on that trip and he's like, look, this uh, there's another player that we're that we're looking at um uh diego chara who's um and by the way there's a little nuance to his last name's pronunciation if any spanish speech speakers out there and i'm not going to try to pull it off but it's it's i'm mispronouncing chara it's chara you know if i try to get it just right i just think i sound a little stilted when i just let's get that on the record <laughs> but uh um you know, he, he's like, this is a guy who I think he was 24 years old at the time um, uh, would be, you know, a, a bigger spend for us, uh, a, a significantly bigger. But this is a guy we could build the team around. Um, I think, you know, he, he, Gavin said, I think he'd be the best eight in the league. Um, and we were looking at him as, 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 as more of an eight than a six. Obviously, he, he plays anywhere um, in the middle, does everything. Um, but uh, and, and, and I said, do it. Um, and, and that's the story of how he was signed. So we didn't, he wasn't in Columbia to, to, to look at him, um, uh, by design, you know, they watched him play. They watched like five or six games. He actually, John Spencer was with him on that trip as well. Yeah. Jumps off the page. I think you gave a little bit of a hint to the second one, you know, the next in the, uh, list of Diego's on the team. I would, I'm assuming Larry is next on your list. What would ever make you think that? <laughs> uh, El Maestro is obviously, I mean, uh, again, I mean, he gets uh, he gets the glory. You know, he's, he's a team, he's a league MVP, um, uh, you know, an MVP of, of, of MLS Cup. Uh, you know, I, again, uh, we could talk about Diego Valeri and, and what he's met off the field even as well in, in, in the community. I mean, it's rare you get a guy that's such – an exceptional talent, skilled talent, um, is is he is you know who's who's equally as impactful off the field and, and means so much in our community and um, you know he is all that. So uh, there's a reason this area has such an incredible love for him. And you know the thing about Valeri is uh, so many people in the MLS era in Portland um, is they've gotten to know the sport. You know he's he's been sort of the, you know, provided a lot of the romance that has sucked them in, you know, the amazing free kicks and, and, and the unbelievable assists. And, you know, my best memory with him, and I can talk about signing him as well, uh, because that's a great story, but um, I don't know how much time we have, but uh, was we were playing the Red Bulls in 2013 for his, his first game here. And, um, you know, he basically juggled, uh, you know, through, um, uh, two or three guys in the box and then finished with the outside of his foot um, to the to the right post. Um, just an unbelievable finish, an absurd first goal. And it was like his first game here. He, 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 you always want big signings to make a splash out of the gate and not have that adjustment period. It didn't take him any time uh, at all. So, uh, again, he's, he's – despite um, uh, Chara getting more and more recognition, Valeri's obviously – you know, synonymous with a lot of fans, um, you know, with the Timbers in a lot of fans' minds, and rightly so. He's actually my dad's favorite player in the league. Your for dad, whatever reason. He's a smart yeah. guy. 
whatever <laughs> reason, he decided Diego Valeri. That's my guy. This is the one. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good choice. Was it weird this off season for you with Diego, where you have to balance those two sides? Uh, when we made the decision about about uh, yeah, all the, just all the the contract back and forth that eventually ended in a happy place, but. I got involved personally in it, to be honest. I mean, and, and I probably should have done it sooner. Um, and uh, uh, I don't do that a lot. So, um, you know, I think we got to a we got to a really good place, both for the club uh, and for him. And he was going to have a really productive year this year. And I think we were going to be able to, and hopefully still will be. I'm not talking past tense. I'm not making, you know, but it's just we obviously – you know, we're, we're, we, we, we all want to be playing soccer right now. So, um, you know, anyway. Diego Valeri, man. Legend in this league. I have another name, and I'm yep. wondering if it's the same name that you would go with for third. Doesn't play for the team anymore. Wasn't an original as well, if I remember correctly. Darlington Nagby. Liam Ridgewell would be my third. Mm. Take me through the third, then, and explain why it's Ridgewell. Um, so I don't think, you know, I don't think that, that, uh, and I'm not, you, you putting me in an awkward position with throwing D's name out there and having to say, no, okay. Let, that's my bad. <laughs> didn't, I thought I, you know, I, I didn't think Ridgewell. So it's gotta be, so there's gotta be something important here. No, Ridgewell has been, the, I mean, he was a captain of our team. I mean, he, he, uh, I, I think he, he's one of the better central defenders in our league history. And I don't think he's gotten the credit. I mean, to, to, he, he's been a general on that back line, his leadership he brought, brought to the club, the influence he had in the locker room. He had such a cultured left foot. You know, his passing, he was a much better passing central defender than you typically see in Major League Soccer. And I think that, you know, maybe because he didn't do the whole Twitter game where he talked up supporters and all this stuff, and he would, you know, he would talk about being on his boat or whatever, you know, and, and he missed some time with injuries towards – the, the, the latter half of his tenure with us, you know, he, he was never a self marketer, but he cared deeply. And in the locker room, he was, you know, he cared deeply about this club. He had a massive impact on this club. And, you know, he's definitely the best, you know, defender, I think, that that, that we've had. Uh, and obviously, we brought in Nat, and, and Nat had, you know, a season and a half, with, you know, on the field with us, but what a season that was. But, but Liam, uh, you know, Liam's leadership in the locker room was really, really fabulous. And maybe you didn't see that as much from, from, from the outside. But, you know, we don't win a MLS Cup without Liam Ridgewell. And, and, you know, and he had a turbulent year in, in 2018. But when he got healthy and reinstated back into the lineup, we don't go to MLS Cup in 2018 without Liam Ridgewell. Um, and so, uh, you know, anyway, that's... That, that that's my third pick. I think that's a good pick. Yeah, I think from playing against the early Portland teams, always exciting, dynamic, end to end. But I think some of the difference was the defensive solidity that Liam was a big part of, and you mentioned Nat as well uh, coming in to make make a difference of a, you know a team that's you feel like should be competing for titles, but to one that goes over and and really gets it done. And then on the fourth pick, I think that's a really difficult pick. I think there's a really good argument for Darlington Nagme. Um, I think there's a good argument for Adi. Um, but I also think there's a good argument for Seba Blanco. And, and uh, you know, Blanc we rode Blanco to the cup in 2018 in the playoffs. We got on his coattails and, you know, he, he, he provided those moments of magic against Seattle in the playoffs, obviously against Kansas City. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think I would probably give the nod to him. Um, uh, and he's with the club right now. Uh, it's a future it's a play. Lot. It's a good future it, it, play. So I'm gonna, because of that, 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 that breaks the tie in my mind. And, and, uh, but I think that in terms of I don't want to take anything. If you're just going to put out a headline that, you know, I say it's these four guys, I, 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 I really would give appropriate props to, to Nagby, who was hugely influential and influential for this team. Um, you know, original draft pick, first draft pick, uh, you know, moving him to sort of that eight central role where he plays now in the 2015 cup run was, was, you know, I don't think we win cup without, without everything that he was doing there going back now and watching all these, uh, 
archived games. I forgot, frankly, of all the, you know, all the things he did. Uh, you know, you just take him for granted. Sometimes when he's here, he's, a, he's an easy guy to, to not fully appreciate. And then Adi uh, was the first forward we, we, we signed that came in and, you know, was scoring double digit goals for us. Um, and, you know, he was a beast and, and, and with the types of service that he was getting and the way we played, he was the right forward for us, sort of that, um, you know, being able to put his back to the, to, to the goal and be physical. And, and, um, you know, some of the, some of the battles he had with Chad Marshall, um, uh, in Seattle, one of the, you know, he, he was a handful and, and you heard center backs talk about how they didn't look forward to him, to, to playing against him. Um, and, uh, and he became more of a physical player and used his physical prowess as a forward with us, uh, the longer he was here as well. Um, uh, you know, and, and I think he, 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 the guys just chiseled out of granite, uh, as well. Um, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to play against him, but Blanco, I'm going to talk more about those guys. I mean, because Blanco ultimately, if, if you had to make me, you know, choose right here and now, I'm not going to do the could be any of those three guys, but I didn't, Andrew, I didn't want you to say somebody else that I said no to. Because that was, <laughs> totally hung I, the I know. I didn't even know. I didn't know I was going got you there. Maybe that was my like Darlington Nagby love shining through. Cause that's what this is really about. Kalen said it like everybody has their own measurements. Everybody has their own way of remembering players. Everybody has their own definition of who they love. We're going to yeah. put our own together. Yours. I saw a the bunch of play. fans talking about captain Jack, Jack Dewsbury, yeah. another big figure of the club. So gee, another talisman, uh, and, 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 you know, huge, huge influential guy for the club. I mean, I wish it was a, a list of five or six. So that's, that's why this problem. is so hard. That's <laughs> the problem. It, it, would, it would be easy, but I, you know, I don't think Liam got the, the New York office kind of love is some of our guys have had. And, and I don't know, you know, I, I know your, uh, your buddy, Matt Doyle was never a fan of, of, of his, but, um, I, 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 I think, you know, when you talk to other teams around the league and, and coaches and GMs and especially people who've coached him here and, and seen the impact that he had, um, you know, he was he was a really, really important figure for us, a uh, player for us. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think I think you got to give him. You know, I would I would certainly give him his due on that. Yeah, I covered him here in Kansas City too, and definitely saw it there as well. One more before we get you out of here. I talked about players you love. We all have our irrational sort of like this is just my guy. Yeah. Who's your Timbers Stan? Who's the who's the player that would not make the Mount Rushmore, but is just the guy that you loved for whatever reason? God, I got a bunch of those. Uh Footy Dancer. Um, another center back would be one that would come to mind who was with us in the USL era and stayed with us. He actually scored the goal. Our first time we, our first goal in Seattle, uh, uh, in 2011 season, we were, we were in, uh, I'll never forget it. We were in a suite with glass partitions and I'm up there watching the game with Gavin and we got so uh, Sounders fans on both sides of us. Seattle scores the first goal and we got fans giving us the, the, the middle finger and Gavin's like putting his hands on my shoulder to keep me from reacting or doing something stupid. And I'm kind of ticked about sitting in a spot where fans can even see us. And uh, late in the game, footy equalized off a set piece. And I go to celebrate with Gavin to high five him. And he's at the, the glass windows with his middle finger up at all. <laughs> I'm like, is this the way you, you know, but anyway, that, that, you know, way, way to show me how to be, show restraint, Gavin. Uh, but uh, you got a little friend popping in behind you there, uh, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, nap time just ended. Yeah. Here, Cameron. Let's Maybe we'll either cut this out or we won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Footy would be my guy. Yeah. I have a picture of Footy actually with his uh, forearm right in my nose in a game against Houston. Playing against him and Pamaduka Pamadu were, were uh, not fun. The Great Wall of Gambia. It was, yeah, and they said that they had uh, Jack Jewsbury, uh, they said was a part of that. So they said it was like, it was, uh, you know, even though not African, he got he got put into the club. Uh oh this guy's not happy. He definitely just... Uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, that's not great timing. <laughs> it's not like our pick. Uh, so Andrew, at least he, he was proud before he saw my 
Yeah, yeah, he was crying before. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna have uh, Kaylin. You wanna just wrap? I gotta take care of this, Mary. I'm sorry, man. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you taking the time out. We won't put any gotcha headlines up on you, all right? All right. This is the. Uh, this is this, this is, is dad life. This is real porn. Real life in porn. I know. Real life in quarantine. All right, Merritt, thanks so much. Andrew Weeby, <laughs> little Cam, yeah. uh, taking on daddy duty, but we appreciate you taking the time and um, uh, giving us your uh, POV on uh, Mount Rushmore for your club. Thanks. Stay safe, Kaylin. All right. Thanks, Merritt. Right. Bye-bye. Big thanks to Merritt for joining us and sharing that. Weeby, I just Mount noticed Rushmore. for people watching on YouTube, I'm wearing the same shirt and hat right now. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is not good, guys. Uh, I just pulled a hoodie over the shirt I was wearing yesterday, but I'm wearing the same <laughs> shirt and hat as well. That's quarantine life, man. <laughs> okay. You know, Merritt's still going to the office. I'm just at home. Like, I got I got my computer sitting on a laundry basket on my bed. Like, this is a... Yeah, that's one of those bit. where you, you look in the mirror. And you're, you're, I'm going to have to think about that one. Yeah, you take some L's here. So, yeah. you guys got the first three from Merritt Wright. Liam Ridgewell mm -hmm. was there. He was the third. He had the two Diego's first. Diego Chara, number one. Diego Valeri, number two, because Chara's been there since the jump. Mm -hmm. I was and a little then... surprised by that. But, I mean, not really, but to me, I mean, Valeri is the name that comes first, but yeah. I, I could understand and when you're in there, um, yeah, maybe from day the day one part of it made a difference, but I, st I still think of like, you know, Valeri's head should be He's like the mayor. He's who I think of, of of Portland when I when I think of the Timbers. Yeah, but. there's like the ultimate consistency with Diego sure. Char too, right? Like Valeri's had some moments where he's been out, but Char's just been there. And I think you could tell from Merritt that he felt that Char had been under overlooked for a long yeah. time. So I think when you see when you're in a club and you see a guy continually overlooked and you get an opportunity to give. Wait, does you know, everybody think he's overlooked? Doesn't everybody recognize him as one of the like three or four best defensive midfielders in the league for like the past ten years? Yeah, well, he the, the, I started, think the past five. Yeah, he only made a couple years. He's ago, only made one All Star team. I think that's what uh, Merritt had said. Yeah, which but de demons, de demons don't make All Star teams. Like the league <laughs> regularly, like the demons don't make best elevens or All Star. I think like I think Diego Chara is like properly rated by the by the fan base anyway you, you can Liam Ridgewell was the third and the fourth drum roll please not Jack Jewsbury not Fernando Adi not Darlington Nagby though I thought maybe that's where he would go because that's another original despite the fact that he was traded he went with the future play which we've done a little bit on this show as well Sebastian Blanco who I think has been their most talented attacker since it's he also arrived. not a pure future I, oh, play. Me, it's not pure future you're right because you know, they've made two MLS cups and he basically pushed them offensively to one of them, right? Like mm -hmm. when you look back through the Timbers, you're looking at Porter's first year MLS Cup and 2018. Is that yeah. the years that we're talking about now? Yeah. So those are your three like peak teams. And if you're going to say 2018 was a peak team and you want to base it off that, you put Blanco in. And that was part of the ritual argument as well. Was so he the, helped the, get them to two? The, the Dyron argument is that Dyron was – key for both of those mls cup runs longevity he had no he absolutely was right and he's you can say what you want about him during the regular season and i certainly have but in the postseason like he's been absolutely incredible he like he and i think he's the only guy who's scored in every postseason every postseason that the timbers have played in which is no no, that's that's not because he wasn't around in 13 but since since 50 he scored in 15 he scored in 17 18 and 19 like even Doyle, do you, do you count yeah. his Timbers two goals in these? In this <laughs> I, do, I, I, I don't. I oh, don't. Interesting. Weird. But the man is a postseason icon. Uh, okay. Let's give Dyron. I think his he's two. he's probably got a better shot at the MLS. Uh, maybe the MLS postseason all time. What we maybe, that, maybe we need to create a new category for that. Yeah, just for Dyron. He's yeah. the Robert Ori. Not MLS. just for Dyron. Don't you disrespect Kalen Carr's postseason goal scoring nice. record, Andrew? Well, this was a way to like grandfather Kalen in. We weren't going to announce it to him. It was going to be a special surprise for him. <laughs> I hope that shed one some day. Tears. Yeah, I think Dane Richards sneaks on that list as well. <laughs> I just appreciate your uh, grasp of Dyron Espria statistics. Do we agree with the first three? Liam Ridgewell, putting him in there. It may not have been the first name that jumped to mind, but once Merritt made the case for him and once I thought back on those teams and also thought back on you know, the center back position in Portland prior to his arrival, 
I think it's fair to put him there to have sort of like the leader um, captain be in that position for two MLS Kip, MLS Cup teams. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, Rich, well, he was he was a good you know he he was mostly a, a pretty good for or center back for his uh, for his duration. But if you look at it, he came in 2014 and they missed the playoffs in 2014. Nat Borchers got there in 2015 and yeah. they won MLS Cup in 2015. And then Nat Borchers got hurt in 2016 and they missed the playoffs in 2016. I like I I don't know. I just don't I don't think I don't think it's a slam dunk, but I under I certainly understand the argument for Ridgewell. What yeah, is I would say the way you described Ridgewell is actually how I would describe Borchers, but Borchers but, doesn't have enough time with the club. That's agreed. The problem. Not as much time. Uh, for Ridgewell, the other piece he has that actually works for him oddly was that Geo pushed him out of the team, and when he came back in the team in 2018 was when they went on, they solidified, went on the run and made MLS Cup, which is odd to say that him coming back from being kicked out of a team by a coach for that club puts him on the Mount Rushmore <laughs> for that club. But I, while he, I while think he was the captain too. I mean, he was right. supposed to be, the, he was the captain at that time. But I think if you're bridging the two generations, quote unquote, of the early success under Caleb and then Geo, Ridgewell gets in there because he started two MLS Cups and they've been to two MLS yeah, Cups. And I think the argument too, and this is what I, I kind of mentioned throughout, was just the idea that they needed, they, they, the back line had been the issue uh, mm -hmm. for, for a long time. And, and so having some solidity there. But we've seen this with other clubs too, is is sometimes, I mean, I think we even did this with Salt Lake, with uh, Olave and Borchers as well, mm -hmm. where Borchers, again, was you know the, the other name we'd been thinking about as well. And does especially in center back pairings it's always so hard it's such a tandem position it's not so much like even a striker position uh, or really anywhere else on the field is this partnership aspect of it where it becomes harder to pick just one of the two like was it Borchers who played a big role in helping that defense or was it uh Ridgewell and does one take away a little bit from the other but I can understand Ridgewell just from the standpoint of for me this club was an always an exciting attacking team especially playing in Portland, that fan base behind, they, they look like they would try and win a game four, 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 three, or, and, and that when they really shifted and made things solid in the back is when they started really competing and, uh, and going for trophies. Can so. I tell you guys something really funny that I've never actually looked at before? Uh, Liam Ridgewell signed with the Portland Timbers on June 25th, 2014. And seven days later, they released a center back named Aaron Long. Yeah. Hmm. That he was a center back that. then. Right, he, he was, was a D-man. He, yeah. he was, I mean, he was a, he was a box to box midfielder in college. I I remember uh, a coach ahead of the draft that Aaron Long was in saying, "Yeah, somebody's going to get this kid and turn him to a center back, and he's going to be really, really good." So. Mm. Nice, and that's how it happened. Are we so are we good with happened. Ridgewell? Do we feel yeah, yeah. I, I feel okay. good with it. That's yeah. our third. What about our fourth? You have some options out there. He went Blanco. I can understand the Blanco aspect, especially he's maybe the best player at your club. I know you kind of rolled your eyes at me on that one, Doyle. But I also would understand Darlington Nagby. I thought just kind of based on what Darlington had given the club from the jump and the moments he had contributed to and the fact that you don't ever appreciate him until he's gone might have been a shout there, helped them win their first MLS Cup. Who who do you think? Who goes on as your fourth, Doyle? Dyron. Just like if you think about the biggest moments in their postseason runs, um, and that's what's you know really defined so many of these Mount Rushmores. Um, they don't get there without that guy. So I think you absolutely have to have Dyron Espria on on Portland's Mount Rushmore. <laughs> even even Diego oh. Valeri, even Diego Valeri <laughs> hasn't scored in each of the last four playoff runs for this team. Dyron has four goals and four assists. They don't advance to either of those MLS Cups without him. You know, and like think about their most iconic non MLS Cup win, right? It's the game against Seattle. And what do we call that game? The Dyron Espria game. He had a goal. He came in, he changed the game. He had a goal and an assist. And then he converted, if I'm correct, the, the, the series winning penalty against the Seattle Sounders in the Western Conference Finals, or was it the semifinal? I don't even remember what it was, but it was like the iconic moment for the Timbers other than that 2015. And it was the Dyron Espria game. 
So I think unquestionably, Dyron Espria has to be on Portland's uh, Portland's Mount Rushmore. I did this All American MLS eleven, and I thought I was pretty yeah. adept at trolling some folks, <laughs> but that you know, I'm not trolling at all, zero percent. If you look at what Dyron Espria has done, like it's it's incredible. Uh Oh, God. My I brain mean, is broken <laughs> at this exact moment, which means Doyle won. He won the argument. Um, my list, obviously, I said Jewsbury because I thought that that's who, like, in saying that, who I thought Merritt would say. So he was on there. Nagby, I agree with in terms of, like, what he meant to the club. I think he was basically the face of the team for a really long time, whether he was vocal about it or not. Um, I was surprised that Fernando Adi was so high on all-time appearances. He's fifth all-time for the Timbers. I don't remember his stay being that consistent like i thought he was injured a little more and he only played one year in the postseason with them um but scored two goals in the playoffs and when you talk about ridgewell i think adi was the linchpin that like brought that team over the edge to this is an mls cup team dominant presence at forward that allowed valeri to play underneath him um shifted nagby even more to a more comfortable position he's second in goals so it's pretty hard to go against him except that he got traded and obviously has now tarnished his legacy in Major League Soccer since that moment, but doesn't matter to the Timbers. So I think Adi's probably fourth on this list for me. Blanco will probably end there, so I'm fine with it. You know, in the next two years, Blanco's going to be the face of the team. Whatever success they have will be on his shoulders. So, yeah. Kalen, you heard the interview. You've had some time to think. You hear the case for Dyron. You hear the case for Adi. I think I made the case for Nagby. Where do you yeah, fall? The, the Dyron one to me is is uh, while I admire and respect you, Mr. Doyle, um, I, I, longevity uh, is a part of our conversation. I understand he's done it over years, but uh, uh, it's been about months for him. And when you look at the rest of the, I mean, he's Mr. November, right? Isn't that what we call him? But it's like when you look at the other guys that we've chosen, like Valeri, and we've looked at a. Uh, yeah, I guess Ridgewell to a lesser degree. Um, and then Chara, who is number one on the list. Those are guys that have been at the club forever and have done uh, – it's it's the body of their work. And so that's where it gets tricky for this last one because Adi, yes, I think he has 50 goals for the club. Um, strong body of work for sure, but didn't I, – I felt like there was more for him. If he could have stayed there longer, if he could have been a part of more. Same thing with Darlington Nagby. I do think right now – I would have him maybe above uh, him and Blanco to me, both have played huge roles in the time in their respective times with the club, but because of what I'm thinking is going to, is going to come from Blanco. Uh, I, I'm going to leave him on the list and, and agree with merits essentially his, his list as well. I want to change my answer. I want mine to be Nagby. Okay. Sorry. Why is that? That's what that's because what I, he was the face of the team, and I think it's Nagby. Yeah, Nagby, and 2013, Nagby was never the face of the team for sure. But he was the first draft pick. He scores the crazy goal. The team was terrible, and he was the only known player, pretty much, outside of Jewsbury, because all their DPS were terrible, and they kept bringing in Freddie Picone and Gaston Fernandez and Chris Boyd and whatever else. I think Nagby was a known entity, and he was start of the team expansion excitement, the Caleb Porter error into whatever else it became. So, yeah. Sorry. And the MLS Cup. I mean, that is that is still the biggest moment in club history. It also feels and like he should be on... that's why instead of it is Rodney Wallace and that nice. third official. Hell yeah. yeah. Assistant referee on that side that let the ball stay in play. <laughs> Listen, that's what Rodney learned overseas. You play to the whistle, baby. Exactly. In Bahia, they never stop. No. Nope. Never stop. They also eat great fish. I don't think we've uh, we've settled this here. I feel like it's Nagby. I understand. Throw it to the fans, one. baby. No, uh, listen. The more and more I'm thinking about it, Dyron. No, no, <laughs> no. Kalen's with I, me. I, I I changed my mind on all these, by the way. But yeah, yeah I think I think I just feel like Nagby should be on somebody's Ooh. club, and yeah. and he wasn't in in Atlanta, even though he was fantastic there, but. I think you look at that team and you, you still think of Joseph and Almiron. And, but when I think of the role he played on those, on those uh, Portland teams, he was, he was one of the best players, you know, probably the central guy in a lot of ways, as far as being able to really facilitate the attack. And um, he's just so consistent there. So I, 
I'm going to lean. I'm going to go back to Nagby on this one. This is classic Kalen. He always overlooks American drafted players because he <laughs> hates the super draft. He doesn't respect those players, but then he comes back around yeah. when they find success later in their career and they become flashier. That's three of four. And Dyron is, you know, he's like the roller coaster. We're building the roller coaster on the backside of the Portland Timbers thing at Mount Hood. And it's the, it's the Dyron Express, baby. Once a year you get on that thing and it's just thrilling. But uh, Darlington Nagby will be our fourth. Caleb Porter has to be the coach, in my opinion. He won him MLS Cup. That's really what it comes down to. So Caleb's the coach here. What's the best team? Is it the MLS Cup team? Is it the 2018 team? Is it that team that was up near the top of the standings in the early days with Caleb? 2013, they won the West. Yeah, so that was the year. They made the playoffs. Which, which team would you take? You know me. I'm going MLS Cup. I, I, I think even when you look at the depth of that team, like we mentioned, um, you know, players that could come off the bench. And I just, I'm trying to remember all the different names, but um, yeah, they, they were pretty stacked going forward. And, um, and this was also, I think Diego Valeri, I don't even know when his prime was, to be honest. He's just been so good all throughout. Well, this this 2015 was actually not his prime because he, he did his ACL at the end of 2014. Yeah. And he came back, he came back in like six, seven months. So he he got healthy real quick, but he wasn't himself until I would say mid-late September. And then in conjunction with that, Caleb switched to more of a 4-3-3 and he brought Darlington inside. So all of a sudden you had a, a central midfield of, of Chara, Nagby, and Valeri. And that's what launched them to MLS Cup. Over the course of the season, they were definitely not the best Timbers team that 2013 team was. But I think what they did down the stretch and then in the playoffs, it's it's – even though I'm a you know regular season supporter of Shield truther, and that 2013 team came closer, that 2015 team once Valeri got healthy again and once they clicked, that's the best Portland team. And to yeah. Kalen's point for MLS Cup, you brought Will John, you had Will Johnson on the bench, you had Jack Jewsbury, you had Maxi Aruti, and you had Diron Espria and Paparato, and it's like we're talking Will Johnson 2015, not Will Johnson 2020. So they did have depth. Um, they could move Rodney Wallace around, and they was, still had more hey, Vio on that team? Uh Grabovoy, I think, had retired at that point. Okay. Uh, but so to to Kalen's you know, point, I, I think they trust, had depth. Yeah, I trust the, the Ridgewell Borchers center yeah, back I would agree. more too. And that was, Ridgewell, I mean, that was Ridgewell's only healthy year. Yeah. Right. That was the only time he played more than two thousand minutes as well. So. Yeah. And I would argue Borchers at his peak that year is the best defender season they've had. For in Portland, because everything agree. else has been a train wreck. Of course, except Pa Modica, who is the legend. Thank you, Pa, for everything yeah. you do. The 2015 the Timbers has been decided. Now, before we get to Devin Pluer, the director of analytics at Toronto FC, it's time for a team with uh, a little bit less history. FC Cincinnati, we love you. Four spots for players here. One spot for a coach. It's an interim coach. Johan DeMay is the coach of the FC Cincinnati. The Johan DeMay observation deck. <laughs> Uh, we're not sure how long it'll be there. It you know, there might be a replacement for it. <laughs> Who knows? Temporary. Temporary, yeah. yeah. Uh, how about the players there? I think, number one, you have to – it's a very easy decision there, and I'm cheating. It's the march. It's the march to the match. Um, oh, boy. There's no other question. No, I'm just kidding. That was only for Dave, and I think his audio's cut out. He's, he's no, I can hear of... you. I was I was reading <laughs> social media responses to actually our tweet that <laughs> Anders just sent us. But, yeah, I would agree Andrew goes on the list. It goes March, Andrew – and then blue, and then orange. That's just the list of the four players. Spencer Ritchie just tweeted Kai Kamara. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I was reading. Okay. At the time. What does that mean? I don't, I don't actually get that. I'm answer. not actually sure what that means yeah. either. That was feels like picked, an inside was joke. Kai, no, Kai wasn't picked in the expansion Kai draft. burned he? down Columbus and then on the way out a little? No, I think he was. He was picked in the expansion draft, then Colorado got him for basically a song. Ah, if I remember ah, right. So oh, boy. So maybe that's a we, decent like, question. You know, what right doesn't go on the, you know what doesn't go on the Mount Rushmore for Cincinnati? Their expansion draft. All right. So, <laughs> Doyle, who you got? So, it, it like, we've been doing all of these kind of in past tense because you're looking back to try to canonize the great moments. Cincinnati have had basically no great moments. You could, you could argue that their best moment um, – as an MLS club, came about a month ago when Jurgen Lacadia, who's here on loan and who was sold for twenty million dollars just a couple of years ago, um, said, "Yeah, even with everything that's going on, 
I still want to come back to Cincinnati. I would like to be here permanently. I think that is literally the best moment in FC Cincinnati history. So <laughs> you're going to look out here, gets his face on FC Cincinnati's Mount Rushmore for number one. I Playing two games. No, the best moment is Alan Cruz scoring in the opener. Yeah, and by the way, all giving me blank now. looks. Am I yeah, no, frozen? By the way, no, no, yeah. by, by the way, beat Portland in that game. Right? Yeah, they won their home opener the first time in MLS. Absolutely. There, there was a march going into the stadium. Okay, unlike okay. anything you've ever seen. And he's he's actually a good soccer player, and he scored that goal. Okay, so that right, would be so number we, one. Alan Cruz okay. is the only person who deserves to be on this list. So there's two of them. By the way, um, Kai Kamara was traded for an international roster spot. He was drafted by, like, yeah. ooh, had a double-digit goal scorer right there in your pocket there, guys. Classic Oops. international roster spot, am I right? Yeah. So we've got two. Where else are we going here? Kendall Waston? He's the captain. I mean, Kendall not many... did not have a great year. Yeah, but who did? But who did? So I would argue for... A... He's already... We already put him on a Mount Rushmore, too, right? He's in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah Kendall is not. Oh, did we? Do we I have thought you guys time? made me kick him off. I thought we no. kicked him off. Yeah, I was pissed about that. No, we didn't kick him off. No, we put you guys him on. kept saying he got traded, so he can't be on. No, oh, well. we debated no. it, but he went on. How about yeah. this one? Emmanuel okay. Ledesma. The I fans love them. The fans will want to see it. If you're considering USL <laughs> contributions. Yeah, but who had what contributions in 2019 were? So were, I would argue for and, I would argue for Andrew Gutman. Not because he was particularly great, but because he's a defender who on his first touch as an MLS player nutmegged a, an attacker who was closing him down. And if you're a defender in your first touch in a pro game is to nutmeg the guy coming at you, then like you deserve <laughs> your face on Mount Rushmore. That's, you know, that's a little all swag. These, all of these are chiseled in soap, by the way. Yes. <laughs> I've never yes. had more respect for what Matt Doyle does for a living than today. Yeah. He has brought the heat on Dyer and Spria, Mount Rushmore, and right now he is feeling the FC Cincinnati Mount Rushmore. I think whatever Doyle says goes. He gets to pick the four. I'm pick game. the four. I'm game for that. I'm, I'm definitely yeah. here for that. You've already got what? You've got uh, you've got Gutman. Mm -hmm. You got Locadia. You got Locadia. Mm -hmm. I got a backup left Alan back. On. I got a backup left back. I got a striker who's there on loan. Has I a fifty percent goal rate though. Scores once every other time he plays. You're yeah. putting on Alan Cruz though, right? Yeah, yeah Alan, Alan Cruz. Cruz. We okay. got so a, a, a midfielder who's he played mostly on the wing last year, so that's great. That's very FC Cincinnati. Um, I'm going with Frankie Amaya for my fourth one. Nice, uh, because like he's. He's really impressive. So one of the things I, I started looking at more over the last couple of years um, with young midfielders is like, are you up for the fight? Like we, we we've ended up producing over the last 10 years, a lot of skillful young central midfielders, but a lot of them just get pushed around. A lot of them, when they're going up against the 28 year old grizzled veteran, um, they're not coming away with the ball. Frankie Amaya comes away with the ball. Frankie Amaya has a little bit of that Paxton Pomacall in him um, and that he's just miserable to play against. I think he's going to end up being a number six and a really, really good one. Um, he's not there yet, uh, but nobody else on Cincinnati is either. So Frankie Amaya gets the fourth spot on uh, on, on FC Cincinnati's Mount Rushmore. I Done. like it. I like Done. Done. Jurgen Locadia. Frankie Amaya, Alan Cruz, and Andrew Gutman, congratulations to <laughs> you. And we've chosen, uh, by you know lack of selection here, the greatest team in FC Cincinnati MLS history. This is the greatest worst team in the history of this league. 2019 FC Cincinnati, welcome to the bracket. You are the equivalent of a play-in game in the NCAA tournament. You're a 16 uh, yo, seed. Johan you DeMay the coach, game. right? Yeah, Johan DeMay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, just yeah, gotta be. Sure. Johan Demay is the best, I'd argue, our number one in MLS at doing the just got the interim tag interview as head coach. <laughs> you know, just the boys are great. We're just looking for a little stability. <laughs> I'm really excited. Oh, how many Rex times has he been the interim head coach now? Okay. Yeah, in one year. Is twice. that a record? How many times? Can it's got to be. It has no, to be. No. There's got to be whatever his name was in Orlando, I think, did it twice. Oh, my God. Yeah. The he had a lot of director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, Cincinnati fans, let us know what you think. Yeah, it's now segue us out little, of this, Weeby. Yeah, it's time to talk <laughs> a little bit of analytics here with our friend from Toronto FC. He's the director of analytics there. It is Devin Pluler. Devin, welcome to Extra Time. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, he also 
we have to note most important thing is the brother of one of the best female soccer players in all of Spain. In all of Spain, yeah. Ho- hopefully, uh, things are going okay for her down in uh, Tenerife. Not a not an awful place to be uh, stuck yeah. in the uh, quarantine. Yeah. Let's talk about what you're doing during this quarantine. If people haven't been paying attention, MLSsoccer.com right now has an awesome analytics guide. You can go www.mlssoccer.com slash soccer analytics guide slash 2020 or just use Google. That's probably easier than the URL. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Newest trends, biggest myths. Devin, you and I have shared the uh, dais at the Sloan Sports Conference at MIT before. You always have interesting thoughts. But I want to know what your sort of side of the field is doing right now. There's no games to analyze, but there's a lot of historical data and maybe some new things coming out because you have time to dig in. Am I wrong? Yeah, for sure. It's actually been a really interesting time uh, for this whole soccer analytics community. And I think also probably quite interesting for analysts inside of clubs. Um, the whole soccer analytics community, I, I think it's been kind of slow over the last couple of years, but I really think it's kind of come back alive a bit during this time. A lot of people have a bit of downtime. There's been kind of a new uh, emphasis on sharing cool new stuff. Um, it seems like weekly I'm finding you know, cool new stuff on Twitter and GitHub with you know, new implementations of research papers and um, all kinds of stuff that I can steal and, and put, put in practice on the, uh, the Toronto FC side. Um, so that's that's been great. There's been you know tons of tons of other sort of you know shows that have popped up. I'm going on a show later today called Friends of Tracking, which has people from you know all, all kinds of you know clubs in this sort of space. So it's been a really really cool collaborative time. Um, on the inside of the club time, though, it, it's been really um, really different. Um, you know, with the the coaching staff um, really not having matches to prepare for. Um, it opens a lot of their kind of headspace up and, and time to sort of work on other projects and spend time thinking about different things. Um, and analytics has definitely been one of those things. Um, you know, uh, while while I'm quite fine working from home, um, you know, I, I've I've really uh, been probably busier than ever in terms of the different stuff coming from different coaches and different people um, asking asking new questions, me building new stuff for them. Um, it's it's actually been a really fun time. How does that process work with your coaching staff? Are they coming to you with a question they want answered? How do they see your services? How do they try to utilize sort of your expertise and combine it with what they're doing in any given moment? It depends on the time of the year. Um, it, you know, the major sort of variables are, are we in the season or are we at, you know, in the off season? Um, is the transfer window open or tr- is the transfer window closed, right? All those different things kind of change what I'm working on at a different time. Um, you know, if the transfer window is about to open, right, I'm probably, you know, working a bit more with the scouting staff, helping them with various things. Uh, if the season's going on, um, you know, I'm mostly working on things like opposition analysis um, and, you know, kind of post-game reporting. Um, and, uh, and and during pandemics, you're working on entirely different things, right? Um, it, it's mostly sort of infrastructure work. Th- you know, time. It's essentially um, an extended off, off season. Um, you know, the off season you mostly spend building things that you didn't have time to build while you're in the kind of week to week grind of the season, right? So, fixing kind of long standing bugs or rejigging infrastructure and architecture. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, very much kind of depends on on that. Uh, so the, for the coaches, you know, it's it's kind of a collaborative process in terms of you know uh, they have an idea, I can kind of have a response to that, or this is how I would look at that, and then we, you know it's kind of becomes a back and forth thing until we settle on an approach or a tool that sort of best answers their questions. You're talking specifically, obviously, about Toronto FC, where you've been working for a few years. Let fans know, though, a little bit. You know, on our show, fans, we have fans of all le- of all clubs in the league. What the layout is for the average analytics person in MLS, and how prevalent is it now at clubs across the league? Um, it, I'd say probably we're, we're close to half, or maybe a little bit more. Um, of clubs in MLS with an analytics person or department, um, you know, and, and I don't want to be, you know, gatekeeping and say who counts as an analyst and who not. Um, but th- there are definitely varying degrees of that from, you know, you know, full-time sort of director level stuff to, to interns, right? So there's lots of different varying levels of investment. Um, but don't take that as a, you know, um, 
you know, as evidence that MLS isn't doing analytics very much, right? Uh, in, in terms of, you know, global global scale, right? Not many clubs across the world are doing this sort of stuff, right? If you look at the, the Premier League, I would say probably similarly, half of the clubs have, you know, real analytics departments, right? So in terms of, you know, uh, analytics investments, sort of like, you know, per budget, right? You know, MLS is, is much more sort of leading the way on that. What's the the big step forward? And every year when we did Sloan, we would sit down and that was always the question. What was the the place where we saw progress in the last year, whether it was in the way that people interpret the data, whether it's the way that they're collecting the data or the technology behind it? What right now excites you in the field of soccer analytics? Um, so what's what's really great about um, you know this last sort of off season is Major League Soccer uh, made a large investment to install um, you know a high end uh, player tracking system at every single venue in Major League Soccer. Uh, it's provided by a company called Second Spectrum, uh, who's been the you know uh, official data provider I think for you know the National Basketball Association for years, right? Um, and you know the you know in, you know ingestion of tracking data into the NBA has changed that game considerably right you know it's it's led to better quantification of you know corner threes and dunks and removed you know the, the mid mid-range game which you know Dave Dave really misses Mellow um, the God yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll see you know we're starting to get that information uh, in Major League Soccer now that's you know a lot of the you know, time that I've been spending uh, working with that new data um, you know luckily we had you know two games of, of uh, data come in before the season got shut down so that's been a bit of a godsend because I can sort of you know use that data as a model for everything that's going to be coming into us when when we do restart um, and, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of really, really cool stuff you can do with it. Um, you know, there's, there's clear implications in terms of, you know, the physical health of players, right? So, you know, you know, we'll be able to, you know, effectively track player locations, you know, close to live, right? So we can, you know, beam down physical insights down to the bench, or we can be using it to analyze tactics in a week to week sort of theater, uh, for opposition analysis, right? So it, it really opens a whole new world, uh, for soccer analytics, specifically for MLS. You were talking Wait, have you looked at our second spectrum stuff? I haven't yet. I it need is, to get in there. We have access as like broadcast side. Yeah. It is wild. It is amazing what you can do with that thing. I have a feeling we won't be doing quite as much as what. No, not at all. They explained it to me <laughs> and I was like, this is so cool. This is beyond me, but it's so cool. That's part of what I always loved about Sloan, David. And that's the last time I'll make that reference. But it's because it's this huge group of people from all these different sort of sports and disciplines and areas of sports business, whether it be like equipment or this tracking software, the actual clubs and teams themselves coming together, sharing best practices. And you were talking about sort of a lull in the soccer space. But in other sports, there hasn't been a lull. If anything, there's been a massive investment. You mentioned the NBA. That's one of the big ones where we hear and see about it all the time. You said you steal things from people, borrow. It's all the same thing. Who are you stealing or borrowing from? Who are you calling outside the soccer space when you're trying to either interpret second spectrum or understand where maybe you can take things where it's not currently at in soccer? Um, so right before, you know, everything shut down, um, was actually the, you know, this year's installment of the MIT conference, which probably shouldn't have been held given, you know, it was a large conference in Boston as things were beginning to break out. Um, but what is great about Sloan is that, you know, you, you put a lot of people in the, the same room that is, uh, that, that, are, that have, you know, they're working in similar positions at different clubs and in different sports. Uh, and soccer very much is chasing basketball. We have been for years. Um, you know, when, when I'm at Sloan, I'm less interested in watching the, the soccer analytics research. I'm actually more interested in looking at the basketball research and what's being done there because they're, you know, you know, four to 10 years ahead of us, right? Um, so stealing different ideas uh, from them. Um, so what's been really cool is, you know, the NBA has had the second spectrum data for um, quite a few years now. So I can bounce around the different, you know, NBA analytics departments and ask them all questions on how are you storing this data? How are you using this data, right? And I can kind of learn from their, their mistakes, right? Um, and what's quite interesting is a lot of the older, you know, NBA teams in terms of this sort of stuff, um, uh, some of the you know, early infrastructure they built, you know, is actually starting to fail on them and they're starting to change, uh, have to change some stuff, right? Um, so I don't want to make that mistake. So I'm leaning on some of these, you know, learnings from other places um, 
to kind of, uh, you know, to make sure that we build a sustainable architecture that we can deliver, you know, these insights, you know, many years in the future. When you look at what the spectrum, second spectrum data will do for you, and you're, you're playing around with the first two, what are the obvious uses that you see sort of in a coaching staff sense? I mean, you talked about some of the health and tactics aspects of it, but what do you expect that they'll be asking you to deliver? What sort of in your mind's eye are you dreaming up and thinking, hey, maybe I can finally do this with this additional data set? So what tracking data really gets you as uh, that we didn't really have in the past um, was an understanding of kind of spatial context. In, in the past, we had, you know, what's known as event data, right? It was essentially a, you know, augmented um, play by play information, right? So it's, you know, player A passes the ball to player B from this location to this location, who then crosses the ball to this location, right? Um, which is great. There's two or 3,000 events per game, and, and you can use that to do all kinds of cool stuff. But the problem is, I don't know if that pass was under pressure or if that pass split a line or, you know, uh, if that player received the ball, um, you know, while he was moving or if he was prone, right? Uh, so it can very much add additional context to all the existing sort of metrics that we've, you know, collected. Um, but, you know, and, and that's kind of like the base level. Um, and, and when you start to get a little bit more advanced, you can start to talk about, you know, quantification of space, right? You know, when a player receives the ball between lines, right, how much space is that player in and how valuable is that space, right? So we can actually start to, um, you know, attach real value to some of those things, right? Which we really had no chance of doing if it was just the pure pure event data, if that makes sense. So the that coaches love, love a lot of the, the spatial sort of stuff. Um, yeah. I think everybody can understand whether they're deep into this side of the game or not, that basically space is everything. Finding it, exploiting it, unbalancing teams and what you do so when you have that opportunity. One of the, the things we hear about all the time and it's sort of become mainstream slowly but surely over the years is expected goals. How much do you trust expected goals? How much do you use expected goals in what you do? And what are maybe the deficiencies and the strengths of that particular metric? Just because we see it and hear it so often when we evaluate results. I'm a big fan of expected goals. Um, you know, before I worked for Toronto, I, I worked for Opta, and my boss at Opta, a gentleman named was Sam Green, he invented essentially what is the modern version of expected goals, right? So it's, um, it, it's been a great tool uh, for um, communication um, and, and kind of, you know, it, it's good for a lot of reasons. The The problem is that it's, it's much better as, uh, I like to call it a unit instead of a metric, right? Um, looking at expected goals by itself is not that useful. Instead saying, um, you know, this pass, right? This has actually increased our chances of scoring on this possession by this amount, right? When you're talking in that fashion, you're actually talking about expected goals. Expected goals is the unit that you're talking about when you're talking about the, you know, your increases the chances of scoring, right? It's a great framework. It's not that great of a metric. Uh, I don't trust it very much on a game to game level, but it is very useful for forecasting uh, future performance um, and better understanding past performance. Um, it's it's foundational, um, but it doesn't change, you know, so much. We've asked you a lot about this, what you're doing coaching side, game on the field, but you mentioned your schedule shifts a lot with transfer markets being open. So when you're working on the other side, the GM scouting side, what is it that you feel like analytics can do and what has it changed in scouting players and also the success or maybe avoiding of some transfers that are made by MLS clubs? Um, I think that a large percentage, you know, more than 50% of the value that analytics departments can provide is on the scouting and recruitment side. Um, the, you know, it helps you make your scouting staff way more robust really fast, right? You know, your your scouts, you know, dep you know, regardless of how many that you have, right, can only watch so many games per day, per week, whatever, right? Um, Analytics, you know, uh, you know, scouting players, you know, analytically, right? Um, you have no constraints in that in that sense, right? Um, even if the the evaluations that you're developing on these players aren't as precise as a scout watching the game, it's never going to replace that, right? It is going to give you a very base level for a lot of games, right? So now I can watch thousands and thousands of games really quick, um, and kind of help shortlist and and make the games that our scouts decide to watch a bit more efficient. So one example that you can do. Um, is, you know, say if you were to rank a player uh, that you were interested in, um, you know, you, you look at, you know, say they had 100 games and, you know, you rank them from their worst game to their best game, right? Say if you only have time to watch five of those games, 
Um, you might accidentally watch five of their best games or five of their worst games, right? What analytics can let you do is, is give you, you know, say actually, oh, these are his 100 games. You should watch this game, this game, this game, and this game to give you a more representative sample of those games that you're going to watch, right? So when you, so now you still have only watched five games, but you can trust your evaluation of those player a bit more with that. So that isn't actually evaluating players, right? The evaluation is still coming down to the scouts there. It just makes it a bit more efficient and makes it so you can trust the your scouting a bit more, right? So there's all kinds of different ways that you can make impact. Um, and, the, and those are just a couple. Not so scattershot. I, I think also about what we hear sort of, again, in the mainstream as these things trickle out and teams don't like to give away their secrets, but we hear about sort of Except profiles. For Toronto. Toronto's yeah. an open book. <laughs> we hear about profiles of players. You know, hey, we're looking for a defensive midfielder. And the way we play, we want this player to be in this sort of area as far as recoveries, this sort of pass that they want to play positionally, these sorts of things. Do you develop those, I don't know, like – profiles to then go out and scout in that way? And how do you build those and how are they effective? Um, I, I'd say that's probably the hardest part of the you know kind of analytics recruitment side. Um, that's not perfect, right? Um, analytics is great at reducing lists of 500 players to 30 players, right? But it's not that great at saying which of those 30 players matches um, exactly the style that we want to play, right? Um, we're getting there and definitely building archetypes is something that is, you know, that we're, we're doing and we've, you know, tried multiple, you know, different approaches to that each kind of, a, you know, I haven't found a silver bullet. I, I don't really expect to. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely a thing that we, we try to do. Right. The, the question is, you know, a player's value is going to be different depending on what team they're playing for. Right. So, um, you know, we want to one, identify our own style. Right, and then also find players that fit into that style. Um, and and if you have a very specific style, you can potentially exploit the transfer market a bit because the way that you value that player is going to be different than the way that other teams value those players. Right. So the better you can kind of quantify style, the more opportunity you have. But it is very hard. We'll leave you with this one, Devin. I think part of this is people tr sort of try to track this conversation is understanding how you and your job can impact the decision makers at the club, whether it's in the scouting department or the coaching staff or ownership or wherever it is, there is an element of translation that has to happen. And I remember an anecdote that I heard, which was an NBA head coach wasn't a huge believer in sort of the analytics shift in the game. And his analytics staff knew that he wanted to sit down on the plane after games with a glass of red wine. And that was when he was most open and it was most conducive to put information in front of him. And instead of putting the huge you know, data set there, they were very targeted. They knew he cared about these five things, so they only focused on those things, and that was how they got through. Essentially, you have to speak the language of the people you're trying to affect. How does that impact your job? And, and I think people at home would be nodding because they might be having trouble tracking some of this as well. It's definitely the hardest part of my job, right? Um, the, the, I've, I've been very fortunate to you know know the game pretty well, and then also know and you know the the you know the data and you know engineering side well enough um, that I can marry those two things. Um, but uh, you know your your ability to you know really talk tactics and talk shop with a you know coach or you know other kind of part, you know member of technical staff right is is very much you know um, important for making um, you know. You know, making an impact. So, so for example, in a you know opposition scouting report, right, the the points that I'm making aren't highly statistically uh, driven, right? It's actually you know, oh, this team attacks down the left side more often than most teams in the league, right? That's tactical, real language sort of stuff. Yes, it's underpinned by statistics and data analysis and lots of database queries, but the output of it is purely soccer language, right? Um, so you need to sort of find ways to sort of bridge that gap, right? Um, and, and finding you know the right kind of communication patterns is is hard. Um, I found that some of my most impactful conversations have been things that were just off the cuff in the cafeteria, right? You just happen to line up in in the you know in line for our magnificent kitchen staff, which I miss dearly. Um, <laughs> 
uh, you know, you just happen to line up, you know, next to one of the assistant coaches and you strike up a conversation. And some of those conversations have been some of the most impactful uh, in terms of the things that I do. Right. Um, so so it's interesting, um, you know, just kind of in the, the whole theater of it, you know, you need to be ready for, you know, when you have your chance to have a certain conversation and you got to talk in the, the right language. Um, you got to be you got to be ready for it. Um, so, so yeah, it's, you know, communication is important. You know, it's, it's not perfect what we, what we do, but uh, it's, it's an important thing for bridging the gap. Big thanks to Devin for joining us. Of course, so head over to MLSsoccer.com or use the MLS app. They've got some awesome content over there about the analytics world in MLS and beyond. Uh, just a reminder, Monday, New England, Colorado, Shalri Joseph, Marcelo Balbo will join us. And on Thursday, we're hoping to get Preki and Miguel Bar to talk sporting Kansas City history in Minnesota. And then we'll be done with Rushmore. So if you have any... Uh, bright ideas on how we can fill time let us know 401-206-0 mls extra time at mlssoccer.com you guys ready let's get out of here can i just ask one quick question sure noel because you like to talk in minutes i normally talk in appearances what's like a good season in minutes for an mls player it it really depends on the player depends on the role but like a solid player i don't understand what you're asking this i'm asking what's a good season in mls for minutes like, what do you expect from a player who's a starter? Two thousand minutes. So 2, in, minutes. every year at the end of the at the end of the season, I do my uh, I do a, a column that wraps up the entire season. I do my first team all MLS, second team all MLS, third team all MLS, and my it's not a hard and fast rule, but my general rule of thumb is you have to play two thousand minutes to be considered. The only time I've made an exception was this past year. Ilsenio got on the team, um, so. But, Go ahead. I was just going to say, in since 2015, <laughs> Dyron Espria has basically played two seasons of MLS in six years. He's played yeah. 4,000 minutes. Yeah. That's your Mount Rushmore right there. Yeah. And that's, qu- that's quick questions hey. with David Goss. Okay, <laughs> questions. Cameron, can you, uh, can you send us out here? Can you say bye-bye, everyone? Bye-bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. <laughs> <Bye now. laughs> See ya. <laughs> <laughs> is it the weekend? What day is today? Thursday. I was going to say, at least Kevin knows what day it is. <laughs>